her doctor, he came rushing in. He said, Mildred, what are you doing? And she said, I died. And he said, I know you did. I pronounced you. This is Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Those moments when heaven and earth collide and God shows his hand, shoots off the flare gun, if you will, saying, I'm right here, right now. Could be through a divine intervention, an encounter with an angel, miraculous healings in a myriad of different ways. He says, I'm with you right here, right now. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. I saw a thing, actually, a study that said speaking in front of a crowd is considered the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. (laughs) Death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. I love that joke. Love it. From Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, if it were only true. It's not. We fear death much more, don't we? We don't trust God all that much. I think this is one area of faith where we just don't trust God all that much. Even though he sends us all the signs in the world, we, we've still got that little bit of Woody Allen in us. So I'd like to ask, uh, how's your relationship with death now? My relationship with death remains the same. Uh, I'm um, strongly against it. And, um, <laughs> you know... What's that saying? Uh, Everyone wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. We don't trust God. Face it. There's a part of you. There's a part of me. Doesn't quite trust God all the way with his timing, who he takes, when he takes, the timing of it all, uh, whether it's taking us or a loved one. We, uh, we, we've, it's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? And yet we have all these signs. God in his mercy keeps saying, do you, did you hear, see this story? How about this? Did you read that book? Did you see Because virtually every person that comes back says the same thing. I didn't want to come back. It was so beautiful and it was so loving and it was, there were colors and it was just so perfect. I hated it when they said, you have to go back. I don't want to go back. Yes, I'm sorry. You have more life. And they hate it. They hate the idea. And despite all that, despite all the clues, all the signs, all the thousands of stories, still we go, I don't know. (laughs) I was just rereading one of the books about this by a doctor. She's a surgeon, a spine surgeon, Dr. Mary Neal. She was, uh, maybe, you, maybe you read the book, uh, it's called To Heaven and Back, which I've named this episode because that's what this is. It's to heaven and back and to trust God in the big picture that he has perfect timing. Dr. Mary Neal, surgeon, spine surgeon. She is kayaking down in Chile, okay, remote. She's out, out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of a jungle, And she's uh, kayaking, and she's kind of forced into part of a river. She doesn't want to go, and she goes off this huge waterfall. Her kayak becomes pinned in the rocks below. She is stuck underneath there, and she will be there for almost 15 minutes. It takes a while for the people around her to even know that she's missing, and then they're like, where's Mary? And then they start looking and looking and looking, and then they see her red helmet. And unfortunately, she is right where the water is the most tumultuous. They can't get to her. She is, she's down there and they can't get to her. There's no way. The water is just ferocious right there. They can't. They try everything. Minutes go by and they, there's nothing they can do. And then God starts working. Uh, One of the people that was trying to save her, a friend, said that's when the supernatural began. Suddenly there was a rock where there was no rock so they could at least get to the boat. They could stand on this rock. It wasn't there before. In fact, After this event, when they came back to that same spot and looked, that rock was gone again. It was miss. It wasn't there for minutes. And then suddenly, oh, you guys need some help? Okay. Suddenly there was a rock. And so finally, rescuers could stand on that rock, which gave them some access to the kayak. I'm going to speed up the story considerably here before they finally were able to get Mary out of the water and over to shore. And she's bloated and purple, and she's not there. They start CPR, and somebody says, why, why, why are you going to do that? If she comes back, she's going to be brain dead. She's been down there almost 15 minutes. But they start the CPR. And every now and then, Mary takes a breath, and it's like, oh, she's coming back. No. And they're yelling at her, come on, Mary, come on back, come back, come back, come back. And, and Mary, every now and then, take a breath, and come on, Mary, come back, come back, right? Now then, on Mary's end, She's down below the water. She's always had an immense fear of drowning. That's just, yeah, don't we all? (laughs) I mean, come on, fear of drowning. And she's down below and she's pinned, but she says, she goes right to God. 
And she says, okay, God, you've gotten me out of things before. You want to get me out of this? Okay, if you don't, God's will be done. At some point, she is no longer in the water. She is coming up out of the water. Her spirit has separated from her body. She's moved on now. And she is welcomed by this welcoming committee. There are these people, like on the shore, uh, glistening, gleaming. Uh, It was nonverbal communication, just mind to mind. I've never felt such love, and she'd never been happier in her life than she was right there in that moment. This was incredible, and she loved this moment, and then suddenly she was being back in her body, taking a breath, and was like, what is this? Then, boom, back to the welcoming committee. And she went back and forth, back and forth. She was feeling this, I'm out of here, this is where I want to be, and then, boom, back into the body again, taking a breath, and she was irritated by it. And she heard the people yelling, come on, Mary, breathe, breathe, and she's thinking, I don't want to breathe, and back to the welcoming committee. And the welcoming committee then takes her towards this hallway where the light was, where God was, and then she had this feeling and those around her, these glistening, gleaming spirits, she felt their, she, I think she would use the word oppressive. It was oppressive because they said, oh, you have to go back. You have to go back. You, you're not done yet. And you'll get more messages along the way, what you're, what you're to do next, but you have to go back. And she was not a happy camper. Back into her body, she began breathing. Came to, sort of, in and out of consciousness. They strap her to a kayak to take her out of there. They're in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. They don't even know where they're going, but they strap her to a kayak and start heading a steep uphill through a bamboo forest where suddenly, out of nowhere, these tribesmen appear. They don't say a word. It's just kind of like, follow us. They don't say a word. They just follow. She said later, were they angels? What were they? But they led them to a path. And then they disappeared. They were gone. Where's this path go? They're in the middle of nowhere. There are no cars around. There's nowhere, there's nowhere to go. But that path leads them to some sort of road. And parked there on the side of the road is an ambulance. What? An ambulance. Why is it there? No rhyme. No reason. There's an ambulance parked there. They put her in. They take her to the hospital. And it, <laughs> it continues the next part of the story. And there's so much more to this story in this relatively short book, actually. And I will link you to... Uh, Uh, to Amazon in this book, To Heaven and Back by Dr. Mary Neal. It's amazing. And there's thousands of these stories out there to constantly reinforce that, that we're supposed to look at it in the big picture, that when he takes us, it's the perfect time. By the way, because Mary Neal's life was saved that day, two people did not die when they were going to die. So God saved. So what, what was the big picture? So, (laughs) so that more people would know that it's just God's timing. We are to trust his timing, and we don't. With that in mind, um, I was talking to Margie Newman, and she talked about her mom and her near-death experience. When my mother was about to give birth, she was in her 30s, she was about to give birth to my sister Sarah, who is, she's 11 months older than I am. She went into the hospital because she had, pneumonia, severe case of pneumonia. And during that her stay in the hospital, she gave birth to my sister, Sarah Ann, but she was very, very ill. They didn't think she was going to make it, and they started to treat her with heavy doses of penicillin. And as it turned out, my mother had a severe allergic reaction to it. So, um, for instance, she lost all the enamel on her teeth, so it was just, they were just all black. My mother says that she was aware that she was dying, and she was aware of someone in her room who was waiting to take her, but she kept fighting it because she had six little girls at home, and she just got had an infant. One day, she said it occurred to her that if she is to be taken home, then God has another plan for her children, and so she decided to just let go and let God do it. She says the next thing she knows, um, and she's not aware of time lapses, but the next thing she was aware of was being surrounded in um, a beautiful place. She said it was filled with colors. She said you could feel warmth and love surrounding you everywhere. She said she didn't see this with her eyes as we see, but it was perceived through her, through her body. While she was enjoying basking in this love and beautifulness, She heard a voice, and it said to her with a surprise, oh, it's our Mildred. And then another voice said, but we were expecting Blanche. 
And so then the first voice said, Mildred, you'll have to go back. We're not expecting you yet. And the next thing I know, my mother says she knew was she was on a table covered in paper. And she doesn't remember what she did or if she said anything to let whoever know that she was alive because, you know, covered in paper, she was in the morgue. But she said the next thing she knew, she was being rushed through the hallways and put back into a room. Her doctor, um, his name was Dr. Rosie, was our family doctor. He came rushing in. He said, Mildred, what are you doing? And she said, I died. And he said, I know you did. I pronounced you. And then sure enough, her sister came in and said the same thing. And she said, Dorothy, I died. And she said, honey, I know they have notified me. That's why I was coming. Wow, that's a wow. And what are, and who's Blanche? <laughs> so, oh, that's the, 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 the ironic piece of the story. Blanche was my mother's cousin who did pass two weeks later. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, did, so did, did your mom let Blanche, did she say anything to Blanche or just let it be? No, no, no she didn't. Okay. You know, you hear about these stories where someone's sent off to the morgue and then they come back, but... Uh, that's- yeah, so you imagine how much time had to have lapsed, you know, between being pronounced and then taken, because they don't take them right down. They, you know, get them situated first, and then someone has to come up there and get them on a gurney when when they can, you know. And they have to be but, sure. They have to be yeah. sure. That has to be astounding for everybody concerned. I don't want to be the person in the morgue when someone comes back. That's not where I want to be, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, for your mom, it's just it's just part of the process where no big deal to her other than why am I covered in paper or whatever. Uh, That's what she said she was thinking. She, so she noticed that she was covered in paper, but she could look to her side. And when she did, she said she noticed that there was a a man next to her. And she said that that struck her as odd because, you know, they don't put men and women in the same room together. So then that's how she started piecing together, right? I'm covered in paper. There's a man next to me. This is not right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you're basically naked on a slab covered in paper, right? Yep, that's how she was. That's how she became aware of being back in her body, being, being there on the slab. Yeah, and you're looking over at some guy <laughs> naked on a slab covered in paper going, that's exactly. not, that's not like, normal. <laughs> right, this is, this is odd. <laughs> yeah. Hi, sir. Are you awake too? No. Hmm. Hmm. This actually helped me in my own life because I don't know why, but as a, a young child, I was extremely fearful of death, and I would um, cry out in anger to God because why in the world did you put me in this place that I'm going to know and be used to and tell me you're taking me somewhere else? I don't know that place. I don't remember it. You know what I mean? Hmm. And, and I would. I would be very upset about it. And so I guess when I was probably about 10, it was in the middle of the night and I woke up frightened, scared that this was going to one day happen to me. I don't even know how the word death came into my life, you know, but, but it totally, totally freaked me out. And so it was that evening that my mother told me about her experience and then talking to other family members, they had, they had all known about it. So, and that helped you deal with death. It helped me very much because I realized that this wasn't some, um, I guess, mean thing that God was trying to do to me. This was a, a benevolent thing where he was taking me to where I had been and he's taking me back home again. And it's, and that's what it is, home. So then, yeah, for the rest of my life, I did read lots of books about near-death experiences and other people's experiences with God to learn more about it. And um, it probably, gosh, probably took me till I was in my 20s to really start feeling comfortable about it and saying in my head, one day I'm going to die and be okay with that. Another comforting thing to me is that um, someone comes for you. So you're not spinning off into the universe all by yourself. You're you're met by someone. When my mother passed, the night she did pass, my sister Nancy was in the room and she said, Mom all of a sudden just lifted her arm and she said, My daddy's here. And then she was gone. 
these are common but uncommon, similar but not similar uh, situations. And until that book was written in the 70s called Life After Life, nobody knew that people were having these similar I kinds read of circumstances. That. Yeah. It's a fascinating book, and he's written more since then. He's, and he's still alive. That Moody is his name. It is amazing. It is very profound. And I think it, it tells a lot to us as children of God that, you know, there most definitely is something else after this life. Thanks, Margie. And again, did God make a mistake? Oh, we're supposed to wait for Blanche. Of course not. Took the right person at the right time to reinforce my faith, your faith, uh, Margie's faith, as it turns out, right? This fear of death that she had took that away with that experience. There are no mistakes. Now, coming up in a moment here, I'm going to talk to Gail Osborne. Now, Gail had an experience that I had not heard of before where she actually accompanied her father to heaven. This one I've, I've never heard before, so this is interesting. And the party that's waiting for all of us. There's a party waiting for all of us in heaven. That's coming up here in just a moment on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. First, three things. Number one, subscribe to the podcast, please, in whatever app you're in. Just hit subscribe. It tells the podcast gods, small g. It enables more people to uh, be introduced to the podcast. Number two, thank you so much for your support, financial support on a monthly basis through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com directly and look for Trapper Jack. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Or just go to this episode here at uh, at touchedbyheaven.net and uh, become a patron that way. And number three, Trapper Jack Speaks. If you'd like me to come and give a talk about these kinds of things, how God shows himself right here and right now, this is what I love to do. So I'd love to uh, talk to you. So go to trapperjackspeaks.com. And take a look at my video, and uh, and if uh, if I'm a right fit for you, let's get in touch and talk about it, all right? Now, let's talk to Gail Osborne here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God, about her experience. Gail's dad is dying of cancer, and she's coming to visit. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Normally, she comes at 3, and she pulls into a parking space right up there close, and she goes, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be here now. She doesn't understand this, why she doesn't go in right then, but she just knows she's not supposed to go in right then. She's supposed to go in at 3. Odd. She thinks she has a perfect parking space, but she pulls out and goes driving around for an hour and then comes back at three and says, yeah, this is when I'm supposed to go see him. The reason I'm talking about the time is because if I'd gone in at two when I originally was going, he died at th- about three thirty. I wouldn't have been there. So the day was planned that I was going to be with my dad when he crossed over. Of course, I didn't know that. So we were having a nice little visit. All of a sudden, what in the middle of a sentence, he had an epileptic seizure. The, the room became filled with staff, and they brought in machines and everything, and I was definitely in the way. So the nurse took me to a small waiting area. It wasn't a waiting room. It was more like an empty office. It had a chair and a sofa and a table and a phone, and that was about it. Luckily, there was no one in there, and I didn't know what happened. I thought, my God, he doesn't need something else to have. He's, he's had cancer. His arm was taken, and now what is this new challenge? And as I sat in the chair, I said, God, if you can't heal him, I guess it's okay to take him because I love him too much to see him suffer one more day. And with that said, I somehow, I guess you can be two places at once. My body was sitting in that room, but my soul and my spirit was walking on a beautiful country road. It was had the feel of a first day of spring after a long, cold winter. And the, the, there were trees and there were birds and there was nothing that was strange. And I didn't see anyone on this trip, but I knew I wasn't alone. And it was just a, I didn't know where it was going, but I was enjoying the journey and I was enjoying the scenery. And all of a sudden came to this turn in the road and at the end of the road was a huge gate. It was a kind of gate that a mansion would be behind, like a movie star mansion. And somehow I had the knowledge that 
behind the gate was a structure of a, some sort of country club type of place where parties would be held. And then I heard the voices, and the voices were saying, Walter's coming, hurry, hurry, we've got to hurry. Walter's coming, and he's almost here. Now, my father's name was Walter, but no, his friends and colleagues at work all called him Walt. But the only people that called him Walter were his aunts, uncles, parents, older people in the, in the family. So I knew, and they were all past, of course, years before, so I knew who it was that, that was speaking. They were all excited, and I heard them getting ready for a, 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 a banquet, like tablecloths were being popped and, and spread on the tables and silverware and glasses, and flowers were being delivered, and it was just the feeling that this is a true uh, celebration for a, a very, very, important person. It was then that the gates started to open. They were opening slowly, like you'd click a garage door open, opener, and they would slowly open as if, welcome home, go old soldier, you done good. And then the gates were fully opened, and I guess he walked through, and I wanted to follow, but I was not allowed. And then I found myself back in that small waiting room. Luckily, no one had entered the room since I entered, because I think if they had, it would have broken my, my uh, vision, and I would have come back sooner. So I'm sitting there thinking, all right, what in the world was that? I, didn't, I enjoyed it, but I didn't know what it meant. The doctor walked in, and he was very sad-faced. And I jumped up and I said, how's my dad? How's my dad? And he said, he's gone. <laughs> and I blurted out, I know, he went to the party. It was, you know, it was that real an experience. When I got to the hospital, before all this went on, he looked at me and he said, Andy died. He, he was so sick and he could not stand to have television or radio, any noise any noise at all. He couldn't stand it. And he said, Andy died. And I said, Andy who? Andy? Like, you dummy. Why don't you know who Andy is? Andy died. And I said, well, I didn't want to argue with him, my goodness. So I just kind of let it go. And as I was driving home here, my father had just died. I was like in a trance. And on the radio came in. <laughs> You're going to laugh. Andy Gibb died in London today. So, wow. <laughs> That's did interesting. Andy Gibb come and say hi to my dad on his way to heaven? This made no sense. Believe me, my dad didn't know Andy Gibb from Andy Gump. And when I liked the Bee Gees, but when I played their music, he'd always scream at me, shut that racket off. But yet he was insistent that Andy had died. Now, I'm not saying it was Andy Gibb, but he, then I, I couldn't believe it. And I, since then, I thought, did I dream that up? And I looked up, look it up. Andy Gibb died March 10th, 1988. <laughs> That's funny. It's, it, but it's it like confirm to me. It's like confirmation that he, when you die, you you have information. New knowledge comes in. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, so um, for him to know, oh, bulletin just in. Andy Gibb died. It's like, yeah, it's just part of you know being you know, on the other side. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it changed my life. It changed my faith, I guess. Well, I always had a faith. I've always asked God to help and he's been there in different other situations of my life, but this just made it solid. You know, it just, that is what it is. And, um, a couple there have been other times, a couple months after that, I had some horses that I kept out at, in a stable in the, in the meadows, and uh, I was driving along. It was a beautiful day, and I was anxious to get out and go horseback riding with my friends. And I knew three songs that my dad loved. One was Green Eyes, one was Fascination, and one was Alley Cat. Those three songs. 
Well, the first song that came on was Green Eyes, and I, oh, that really put me in a good mood. I was singing along with it. And the second song was Fascination. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. Well, this is a little weird. And the next one was Alley Cat. <laughs> and I said, hey, Pop, you must be in the car with me. You want to go horseback riding? And, and what, who was playing this? Who, was, who played those three songs? It was on the radio, and I was listening to, uh, you know. Like nostalgia radio kind of? I mean, that's, those, those aren't, you know. No, that was the part, part that was so funny. That was a station that never played anything but rock and roll and, and you know, current songs. Those are oldies, Green Eyes, Fascination, Alley Kit. Your car radio was doing things nobody else's was. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> really, that's, that's, that's cool. I have no doubt about your story at all. God did that for you. God gave you a I, gift. But I knew he was with, and you know, they talk about celebrations in heaven. They were always having parties and stuff. And that was totally a party. It was something for a head of state. And it was all for my dad because he deserved it. He was a, he was a fine man. This is, this is what gets you excited about God. You know? Yes. Yes, and, and it, it does. It, and it creates a deeper relationship, as, as, which is what you said, is that it confirmed, it fortified, it, you know, you, you're closer. You just know it's real. Yes, it goes right to your heart. And you can read books, but it, that, that, it goes right to your heart and you know it. I, I gave it. I've given a couple of talks where I talk about how inside a church, that's where my evangelization is, inside churches. And I have said everything that happened 2,000 years ago is still happening, only it's ap- happening, we're hearing about it out there. And that's, and that's true. That my, is true. My podcast is still out there. And the internet is out there, and YouTube is out there, and a lot of these books are out there. And so that's why church can look so quiet and so boring to so many people like me who left the church for a long time. You had an encounter with God. Isn't that just the coolest thing in the world? It is. And sometimes I think, oh, gee, I'm not... Oh, he, why should he care about little old me? But that's a negative thinking. I don't think that anymore. I, uh, I want to claim that he does care about me. And I thank God every, and I thank him every day for caring about me. Very good. Thank you so much, Gail. God Thanks, bless you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Gail. Gail Osborne here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. The big takeaways, again, of course, hopefully fortifying a little bit more is that uh, heaven awaits, God awaits, our loved ones await, and they're planning a party, big party. Everybody gets a big party. Everybody gets a mansion. It's all good. What are we afraid of? Don't know, but we still are. Uh, there's still a fear there, and uh, uh, but not as much as public speaking, of course. Oh, speaking of which, boy, look at this transition. I am the master of segues. Friday, November 3rd in the Cleveland area, lifeworksohio.org. I'm the keynote speaker for this LifeWorks annual event. It's a pro-life group that does amazing work. So check out tickets for that event and uh, hearing me at that event by going to LifeWorks, uh, LifeWorks Ohio, lifeworksohio.org, or just go to episode 28 of Touch by Heaven, and there's a link to that event. Okay? Okay. Now then, in the news of the miraculous, and here is why we do Touch by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Uh, I keep saying that everything that was happening 2,000 years ago and before is still going on today. There are still encounters with angels, and there are still moments of divine intervention where God changes things, puts his hands into into things, as, as is true in this episode. Uh, there are miraculous healings and all that still going on today, right? But do people believe that? Do they know that? Latest survey out of England, 2,000 people surveyed. Half the people say Jesus didn't perform those miracles we read about. Yeah, that's how bad it is right now. That's how bad it is. In England, half the people when asked, did Jesus perform those miracles? No, no, not, not, in the, way that, no, not the way they were written up there. Nope, nope. In fact, a third of the people say uh, there, there are no miracles, period. There is nothing resembling a miracle in the world, period. A third of people say that there's just, and those numbers just keep getting worse over time, over time. And that's why there is a touch by heaven, if you will, Everyday Encounters with God, 28 episodes where, and plus the Blind Faith Live podcast, just miracle after miracle after miracle, but word isn't getting out. We uh, we have a distribution problem, uh, as I've said before. We certainly have a distribution problem. Oh, by the way, I still haven't heard from you in your story. Yes, you have a story, an encounter with an angel, perhaps? Divine intervention? 
something miraculous going on, some kind of encounter, some kind of thing that happened that God was shooting out the flare gun and saying hello to you specifically and had a message for you specifically of God's love, right? Uh, contact me, would you? Contact me at touchedbyheaven.net. Touchedbyheaven.net. I want to hear your story, okay? And I will see you next week for another Another Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. See you then. I'm Trapper Jack.